God has a plan and a purpose. If you're new or visiting, we believe in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. And so right now, in, in Sunday morning, we're doing a study in Acts, verse by verse. We hit uh, uncomfortable verses, and we hit comfortable verses. We, we uh, like doing that. That way, there's a topic in almost every single study. And so, we find ourselves in Acts 22 this morning. Acts 22. And I told the guys wrong. I said 23. It's Acts 22. My mistake. Acts 22. And we're going to go through verses 1 through 30. 1 through 30. The whole chapter. So, Instead of reading all of it like we normally do, we'll read it as we go. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for the morning. We thank you for all you're doing in our midst. We are so blessed. It's, it's getting crazy. This whole world has just gone crazy. But we know in the last days that that is one of the signs. Men's heart, mankind, their hearts are going to be failing them for fear of what is coming upon the earth. So Lord, we thank you and praise you that your word says that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but you've given us the Holy Spirit to give us a sound mind, to bring us the peace of God, that we are citizens of heaven only passing through, and that we're to have a light touch on the things of this earth. As we've already read, the, the thousands that are going to die this very day in America thousands. Help us to have a light touch, a light hold, and help us to hold on to your truths, your promises, and to look forward to meeting you face to face very shortly. Father, I pray for the gift of teaching and that you'll be glorified through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're new or visiting, we find Paul this morning standing in front of the Jewish Sanhedrin. This council was the highest court in Israel and was made up of 71 religious political men. Even though they were ruled over by Rome, they had considerable power or authority that was granted to them by the Roman officials. This is also the same council that Paul was possibly, possibly, I don't, I don't think we know for sure, but possibly a member of as a Pharisee earlier in his life. You'll remember his name was Saul, Hebrew connection. But he, as he started to minister to the Gentiles, he used his Roman name, Paul, Paul. It was not uncommon to have two names at this time, especially being a natural-born Roman citizen, which we learned about last week. So this was the same council that Jesus stood before, being falsely accused prior to his death. This was the same council that Peter and John stood before in Acts chapter 4, and were firmly told not to speak anymore about the resurrection of Jesus. In Acts 5, we saw that all the apostles stood before this council and were beaten because they continued to speak about the resurrected Jesus. Are we getting close to this time in America? In Acts 7, we saw Stephen or Stephen standing in front of the same council and it was by their decision, this religious elite, it was by their decision that he was stoned to death because of his stance about Jesus. Paul is now on the opposite side. He's now not maybe possibly a part of the council. He's standing in front of the very council that might have had those others standing in front of them. Very powerful. And his life is in the balance. Verse 1, Acts chapter 22. Brethren and fathers... Hear my defense before you now. You see, Paul addresses this council in a way that insinuates that he was a member at one time. Others would have addressed this council with more respectful terms. But notice that Paul says, men and brethren. He knows that they know him. And that he was once closely connected to their council. He knows that they're familiar with his previous actions against the Christians. That he was a man that was so zealous for the law. That he traveled great distances to bring back to Jerusalem those who were Christians. To have them tortured and even killed. They know this man. 
They knew that who he was, but yet now he has been being accused of being a traitor to the Jewish faith. So he makes a statement that carries tremendous weight. I have lived in all good conscience. And when they heard these, oh, hello, I'm reading 22, it is 23. Hello. I'll get there, don't worry. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, hello. Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. There it is. Okay, now we're on the same page. It takes me a while. <laughs> Conscience. This is interesting that he used the word conscience here. He makes this statement, and it carries a tremendous amount of weight. I have lived in all good conscience. I look at conscience as a conviction meter, as a conviction meter. I've had discussions the last few weeks with some teenagers about standards, about standards. And all of us in this room, we have a certain standard. But there was actually a, a um, survey done, a random survey, anonymous survey, where they would ask people over the phone, would you kill someone for $1 million if you knew that you would never be caught? Would you kill someone? I forget the percentage, but there were people that actually said yes. You see, we all have standards. We all have convictions. The definition of conviction is an inner feeling or voice viewed as acting as a guide to the rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. So Paul says, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. Was Paul wrong in saying this? I personally believe that a conscience is a good thing when it is based upon the truth of the word, but it can also lose all power of sensibility when given over to the flesh. And unfortunately, in counseling sessions, I have to shake my head at certain adults and go, why are you thinking this way? That makes absolutely no common sense what you're trying to tell me right now. It makes absolutely no biblical sense what you're trying to tell me. But, well, we'll get to the scriptures. In other words, the conscience is not to become a guide, but rather the conscience must be guided, and it must be guided by the Word of God. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Very quickly, got quite a few scriptures. If you're new or, or visiting, we believe in the Word of God, so we reference a lot of scriptures. When we bring something up, we want to back it up via the Word of God, not just what I think. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifesting of the truth, manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God." You see, guys, when we were raising our children who are now all in their 30s, we would always take them back to the Word of God. So as a parent, um, I would encourage you, whether you're single or married, to take your decisions back to the Word of God because the Word of God is not going to change. And so a year from now, when your child comes and asks you the same question they asked you a year ago, you're going to be able to go back to the Word of God. You're not going to say, well, you know what, I've, I've kind of changed and my, my convictions have changed now. See, you are becoming the problem for the next generation. Now, if you're not, don't take it personally. But if you are changing and you're not going back to the word of God, but you're changing because culture is changing, as an adult, you are the problem. And you need to get control of your convictions by the Holy Spirit via the word of God to help get your children going in the proper direction. Yes, they're, they have free will, they're stinking little sinners and they're going to make their own choices. But let's not help them make poor choices. But even if our gospel is veiled, verse 3, 2 Corinthians 4, 3, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age has blinded. Was that any of you? 
Feel free to raise your hand, every single one of you, because you and I were blinded by the God of this world at one time. You were not born a Christian. Hate to break it to you. You were not born a Christian. You were born a sinner. And you got to that place in your life where you finally acknowledge that, that I'm a sinner, but what do I do? And fortunately, I had someone who was there to say, there's an answer. It's Jesus. And he will save you from your sins. And he will transform your life. Whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who did not believe, lest the light of the glorious, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And guys, that's why I made this up. You see, on the back is the light of the glorious gospel. On the front are just some facts, and people may argue these facts because they don't like facts. They like their emotions. Don't confuse me with the facts. No, these are the facts. But here are the other facts. They're blinded, guys. We shouldn't be surprised by the way our world is going at all. We should not be surprised. We just read it. Little G, the God of this world, the little God of this world has blinded them. For we do not preach ourselves by Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants, your slaves, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, that would be Jesus, who has shown in our hearts, the believer's hearts, not the unbeliever, the believer's heart, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. So you and I, guys, we are light bearers. Hebrews 10.22 says this, Let us draw near with a pure heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And that pure water is the water of the word. Why did I stop smoking cigarettes? Because I read the Bible. I didn't read the side of the pack that said Surgeon General says. I read that for years and could care less. It was the word of God. Why did I stop smoking marijuana? Why did I stop getting drunk? Why did I stop having premarital sex? All of these things. Why, why, why? The word of God. Not because, oh, I'm religious now and I have to get clean. No, no, no. I have a relationship now and God is trying to keep me safe. You know, I could have a prison ministry right now, guys. Don't think that you could smoke marijuana and drive. You young people, don't think that you could smoke marijuana and drive. I did it. I thank God that I don't have a prison ministry. I could have killed somebody. I got home. I had no idea how I got home. It's no different than alcohol. And you will be found out. They have tests. You will be found out if you're driving under the... And that's as well as prescription drugs. Do you guys know that? If you're on prescription drugs and you kill somebody, you will be held accountable. You, it, the, the label says on your package, do not drive. So we can take it to the extreme of regular drugs, but we can also use it with prescription drugs as well. We have to be wise. How about 1 Peter chapter 3? 1 Peter chapter 3, 14 through 16. This is so applicable to you and I today in 2020. For even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Marriage, according to the word of God, has not changed. Marriage is one genetic male, one genetic female, period. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, your teenagers, maybe your adult children aren't going to like you for saying that. I don't want to be liked. I want to be scripturally correct. I don't want to love my children to hell. I want the Holy Spirit to be able to convict them, not me, the Holy Spirit be able to convict them of the truth. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Notice this, guys. What's going on in our culture? Fear. Fear. Fear drives what? Fear drives willing to release my freedoms because somebody else knows better in Washington, D.C. This is not new. It's Satan's been doing it for thousands of years. It's just in a different package in 2020. The package is COVID. Different wrapping, the same scenario. Fear, control, fear, control, fear, control. 
What are we going to allow to cause us fear that will allow someone else or something else to control us? Verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That word sanctify means set apart. Set apart. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. With what? With meekness and fear or with humility and reverence. Not bashing someone, not beating them up with a Bible, but also not backing down either. Don't be afraid. Don't back down. Truth will prevail. Verse 16, notice when we do this, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. If that doesn't happen on this side of earth, uh, heaven, it will happen on the other side. Back in Acts, why is it so important that I do not allow my life to be guided by my conscience? Because of my selfish nature. My conscience can become hardened and cold towards the things of God. For time's sake, write these verses down. I'm going to read them or take a picture of the screen. Titus 1. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. An example for that would be, oh, I'm a person of faith, but I'm wholeheartedly promote abortion. Doesn't work. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. Black Lives Matters. Black Lives Matters is not concerned with black males at all. That's just a fact. Don't get caught up in these political things. Know the Word of God. You see, without the whole Bible being our standard and guide... A person will eventually do whatever he deems is right in his own eyes. This is taking place in our society and obviously becoming very dangerous to the individual as well as to those around that individual. It can also impact a whole nation as we see what happened to Israel in the book of Judges. In Judges 22, 25, we read this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. In America today, is there a God? 75 million Americans said no. That's just reality. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Oh, you want abortion? We're fine with that. Oh, you, you have an issue with your gender? We're fine with that. Oh, gay marriage? We're fine with that. Slavery? Sex slave traffic? We're fine with that. It's reality. Don't argue with me. It's reality. You see, without the whole Bible being our standard and guide, oh, I already read that. This is taking place in our society. I already read that. Read that. Down to here. So Paul lived in all good conscience for that day. In a sense, yes, he did. He sincerely lived according to what he thought the Bible was telling him to do, even as he was killing Christians. He had a clear conscience in his mind. But he was sincerely wrong in some of those actions. But when the whole counsel of God guides our conscience... We will then have a clean and not just a clear conscience. You see, somebody can be living together, having sex outside of marriage, and they can say, I have a clean conscience. We're married in God's eyes. No, you're not. No, no. You need to have a clean conscience. Back in Acts 22, 23. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth, slap him across the face. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. For you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Notice Paul's response in verse 5. Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. 
Slapping Paul across the face could have been classified as being against or contrary to the law. Leviticus 19.15 says this, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. But the way that Paul answered the high priest was not good either. Jesus talked about the white wall sepulchers in Matthew. If you'd like to turn to Matthew. If not, I'm going to read it real quick. Jesus speaking, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This is called being a chameleon. Depending on who you're speaking to, you change your agenda or your speech, not your agenda, your speech. Maybe Paul remembered this time in the temple area when Jesus was exposing the hypocrisy of the religious elite. But I think we can see that Paul didn't have the same intent that Jesus was making, which was a call to repentance. But in another gospel, Jesus shows us the proper way to deal with a situation like this. In John chapter 18, we read this. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? See, Paul would have known the scripture that says, as we just quoted, Exodus twenty two twenty eight, you shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. So again, let's look at verse five. Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil, the ruler of your people. What's the real reason that Paul spoke this way? He probably didn't know that he was a high priest because of his poor eyesight. Galatians 6.11, which was written in 48 to 49 AD. See what large letters I have written to you with my own hand as Paul signs off his letter. Large red, right, letters, his own hand. What, what's that all about? Well, if you look at Galatians 4.15... What then was my blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Paul had respect for the position, if not for the person. And the New Testament teaches us that as well, that we should have respect for those who are in authority over us and pray for them. Here's just one reference in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. Therefore, exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men or mankind. Notice what Paul says, for kings. Oh no, not for kings, for kings. And all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. It's the word of God, not your own convictions or your own conscience. Always go back to the word of God. But when Paul, Acts 23, 6, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees, and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection. So an easy way to remember that, sad you see, they don't believe in life hereafter. They're sad. And no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Very important. You see, even if Paul didn't recognize the high priest, he did know that he was standing in front of the midst of a group of men who were confused over the scriptures. So he makes the point of being a Pharisee and then lets the men start to debate themselves. It is interesting that years before, when the apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin, the great Rabbi Gamaliel stood up and spoke these words. And I would encourage you to really pay attention to these words in Acts 5, 38 through 39. I believe in the word of God. 
I do not elevate the word of God above the Constitution. If you're looking for a church, this might not be a church for you. If you stick around, you'll understand why. The Bible's been around for thousands of years. Don't ever elevate anything, your mate, your children, any relationship, don't elevate anything above the word of God. Everything goes back to the word of God. Very important. Why? Gamaliel says, and Gamaliel was one of the top and still is one of the top rabbis that ever lived in all of Israel. Now I say to you, keep away from these men, the disciples who they were trying to get to be quiet. Stop talking about Jesus and let them alone. Here is Gamaliel's wisdom. For if this plan or this work is of men, if bringing America down is of men and God wants it to remain up, it will stand. But if Jesus is coming back, which he is, and his promises in the New Testament tell us that it is going to get worse prior to his return, listen to what Gamaliel says. If this plan is, or of, of this work is of men, it will come to nothing. Just leave it alone. It'll come to nothing. But if it is of God, and this is what I challenge you as your pastor, in a loving way, I challenge you. Be careful how hard you fight for the Constitution. Because the Constitution is not above the Bible. Just keep that. You pray about that. You decide about that. But it is, is it of God you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. I'm not going to be found fighting against God. If it's God's will to bring America down, I'm on God's side. God knows what's best. Get right and make sure that you're on God's side. Do what you need to do to protect your family. I'm not saying any of that. I do that. But be careful that you don't take it to the extreme and fight against God. Verses 10 and 11 now, when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring them into the barracks. But the following night, the Lord stood by Paul and said, notice what Jesus says to Paul. Be of good cheer, Paul. Be of good cheer. Could that maybe tell us that Paul's a little concerned? Maybe he's a little worried? Maybe he's a little anxious. Not a lot. This guy's been through three missionary journeys. Read what happened to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This, this guy's not freaking out here. But maybe he had a little concern, a little anxiousness. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Jesus says, be of good cheer, Paul. For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Guys, in the last days, Israel is going to stand by itself. Read your Bible. When Russia and other nations attack Israel, there's no one to defend Israel. Why? God defends Israel. God comes to the rescue. That's what makes them realize there is a God. God comes to the rescue. You see, if Israel was attacked today, who would come to their rescue? Say it. Who would come to their rescue? America. We'd be there. We'd be there. Well, if the Bible says no one except America, does your Bible say that? The Bible says no one. Read Zechariah chapter 12. Jerusalem is a cup of trembling and every nation will come against Jerusalem. What is, what is our... What's the future government want to say? Has already said? Israel needs to go back to 67 borders. And there needs to be a Palestinian state. That's dividing Israel in half. What's going to happen to America? I can guarantee you God's word is going to come to pass and America is going to be cut to pieces. I don't know how, but you better be ready because it is going to happen. Don't poke your finger in God's eye and think you're going to get away with it. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Be very careful about, about vows that you make. Now, when there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy, they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. 
Now you, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So they come to the religious elite. We want to take a man's life. You're okay with that, right? Yeah, we're okay with that. Okay, good. We're all in this together. Religion is very dangerous. So when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul, a prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. So the commander took Paul's nephew by the hand, went aside and asked privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them. Can you imagine this young man, this kid telling, telling the commander? The commander's over a thousand Roman soldiers and he's saying to his face, listen, don't listen to him. This is the Holy Spirit working. But do not yield to them for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him. Men who have bound themselves by an oath that they, they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. Very, very interesting. God is out watching for his children. He knows how to take care of them and get them to their appointed place. Very important for you and I to remember that. Where's our appointed place? Does anybody know where our appointed place is at the end of the day? Anybody want to say it real loud? That's our appointed place, guys. We're going to get there. What happens in the interim, my wife and I talk about it almost every single day. We're not excited about it. We're not excited about what's going to come down. We're grieved, very grieved. But our eyes are on heaven. And that's our joy. Guys, keep your eyes on heaven. Psalm 37 says this, the steps of a good man, which would be a Christian, a person that knows Jesus as their Savior, are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Very, very important. And he called two centurions, saying, prepare 200 soldiers. Remember, a centurion was over 100 soldiers. Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night, which would be 9 p.m., and provide mounts, or horses, to set Paul on, and bring him safely to Felix the governor. He wrote a letter in the following manner, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to kill them, be killed by them, coming with the troops I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> He's acting like he knew he was a Roman prior to that. No, 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 no. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. He forgets everything about binding him and going to scourge him, all that. Nah, no, you don't want to know any of that. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man. I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as the music team comes up, then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. The next day they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea, and had delivered the letter to the governor. They also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear, hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. Very, very interesting. So what do we see? Don't check out yet. Let's get the big picture. What do we see? Paul was commissioned to go before kings. He had not been to kings yet. So he was going to get before kings. God was going to make certain of that. God was going to make certain of that. Jesus is coming back. God will make certain of that. Jesus said it will be. It will be. Just settle it in your hearts, guys. It's the word of God. 
It will be as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and as it was in the days of Noah, Lot and Noah. In Noah's days, there was violence upon the face of the whole earth. But there was also a lot of money and they had leisure time, it says in the scriptures. Very interesting, the parallels that are taking place. Jesus is coming back. Get ready. It doesn't matter who's in office. Nobody in Washington is stopping Jesus from coming back, guys. Nobody. But for you and I, we can live in fear or we can live in faith and have the gospel ready to give someone who is living in fear. And they have no hope. Like I shared with you, that waitress, we gave her the gospel. We prayed for her. She was so happy that we prayed for her. She was so happy that we explained. This was before I printed these. But we took the time to explain a little bit. And you know, they're busy. They got other tables, so we weren't rude or anything. But we just explained quickly what was going on. She was so relieved. But now I'm going to use a track. You decide what you want to use. But let's use something. People need an answer. They don't need an argument. Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness. And we're in desperate days. It's not surprising to you. And Lord, we do wanna take care of our families. We wanna defend them to the best of our abilities, but make sure that we have that balance in our lives, Lord. Make sure that we don't get caught up and go on an extreme. May we never elevate the word of God above anything that man may create. For your Holy Spirit inspired the word of God and it will come to pass. Guarantee. So Lord, help us to stay focused. Again, we do pray for Derek and his families that, that you would make these paperwork issues uh, go away, if that's your will. We know you have a perfect plan for him, for his wife, for their family. If it's to remain here in the States, so be it. If it's to go back to Africa, so be it. Your will be done because we can always look back and see your perfect timing. You're never late, you're never early. You're always right on time. So give them peace, Lord, while they're here. Use them mightily around their family members and neighbors and coworkers. Use them to spread the gospel as they're here in the States, Lord. And as we go out into our mission field this week, may we, be available for our mission field and give the living hope, the living hope. Our hope is not in the presidency. Our hope is in Jesus. Our hope is in the word of God. Lord, help us to feed that living hope from Genesis to Revelation that you will be glorified through our lives this week. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Let's stand, guys. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, please come forward. We'd love to pray for you. If you need prayer for anything, please come forward. We'd love to pray for you. God bless.